Well, I think I've made it here today with all of my various trappings and gadgets that I need to keep from asking one of the other pastors to run an errand for me in the middle of the sermon. But if you are going to the music meeting uh, after worship, you need to know that Donnie will be running out to get the lunch partway through. And so it's just going to be us here, and we'll try not to tear the place to pieces while he's gone. But uh, we are so glad that you're here today. I want to add my word of welcome to that that you received earlier. And as we are beginning today uh, a new sermon series, <clears throat> I'll tell you that uh, we are launching out into a look at one of the uh, most active books in the Old Testament. We will be looking for a number of weeks into the book of Exodus. There are 40 chapters in the book of Exodus. And the particular book, of course, comes right after Genesis, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible uh, attributed to Moses. We do know that uh, there's a piece or two of it that Moses didn't write because at one point his death is recorded. And so the record of his death and what happened to him after he died, I don't feel like he wrote that, but we'll forgive that little piece that somebody else put in there. You know, it's kind of like when you write your own PS on your grandchild's card after somebody with legible handwriting wrote it, you know, the big piece of it and that kind of thing. Uh, no, the Lord worked in that and put it all together. And I personally, I accept the Mosaic authorship and have always thought that. And what amazes me is the man did so much uh, at 80 years of age. Now think with me for a moment. Moses, uh, and we'll see the story in detail as we work our way through, of course. But as a child, Moses was adopted into Pharaoh's household where he spent the first 40 years of his life in absolute privilege and luxury. And then he messed up. Uh, you know, sometimes people just do dumb, dumb things. It happens, you know. And, and so he derailed about age 40 when he killed somebody. And, and so then he fled for his life. Well, you know, in today's world, if, if someone kills someone, the law enforcement Agencies will expend massive amounts of money and resources to go find them on the backside of wherever. But in Moses' day, once he was out of the city uh, and in the wilderness, very few people were going to go look for him. So he went hiding in the wilderness for the next 40 years. And then the Lord speaks to him at 80 years of age uh, and calls him to deliver or to be used to deliver the people of, of the Hebrew people who would later become Israel. So we're going to start looking at that. And as we do that, I want to uh, mention to you there are a couple of things you'll want to do. Uh, one of those is pick up one of these reading guides. Patrick put this together for us. And they are on the tables as you enter or exit the worship center and at a couple of other places around uh, the building. And this one is there. Uh, so that you can delve deeply into the book of Exodus along the way uh, as we are uh, into the study together. So stand, if you will. We're going to read from Exodus chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. And this particular passage is in the context of God calling Moses, but what happens is it reveals God's purpose for uh, the entire, for the entire writing and for what is presented in the book of Exodus. In chapter 3 and verse 7, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. 
And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. May our Lord bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. Now, just by way of, of introduction, just as a, an introduction to the series, uh, what, what I'm going to do today is just touch on some key themes, and uh, we'll, I'll just mention kind of a big, big picture overview of the book of Exodus. Now, I, I don't know if any of the rest of you, have, of you have ever gone to the travel section of a bookstore, but I'm a book a book nut. You know, I like books. Uh, in fact, years ago, I, I was not yet in the ministry, and I, I just love books. I read, or used to read more than I do now, but a friend of mine offered to give me the inventory to start a used bookstore, and the Lord was already leading me in some different directions, and I turned him down on that, but that that is how much uh, I love books, and so when you go to read books, you find out that words are extracted different ways and different places have different names. And if you go to the travel section of the bookstore, you can find the step-by-step -step guides. Now, what happens is you go into that section and you get this book, and let's say it's on New York City or it could be on San Francisco Highway. No, none of y'all want to go there. Uh, it's a long drive. If you fly, it's a long flight. I don't know. You may want to go to San Francisco. I mean, wherever, you know. It may be you want to go to Wisconsin and sample the cheese or something. But you get a travel book, and you open it up, and it describes the place you're going, and it has a few words about the local customs. And then it tells you, okay, you want to go eat. You go down this street for so many blocks, and you turn right at this intersection, and you go so many blocks, and you turn left, and you stop there, and you walk up a flight of stairs that you find halfway down that block, and at the top of that flight of stairs, you find this lovely restaurant that serves the best food you've ever had. And some of you may have seen books like that. Well, this is going to be that bird's eye view now, a tour guide gets a different kind of training. A tour guide gets to go to travel to those places, and they don't necessarily go to all those places, but they go to the city, they have the guide, and they may fly over the city in a helicopter or something like that, but they don't literally take every step until they lead the tour. And so what I'm going to do today is give you that helicopter view, that big-picture look of the entire book of Exodus. And of course, you know by now, it's only front of one page, and so it's only one hour at the most, right? But it's going to be just a brief overview of the entire book of Exodus. And so here we go. The word itself uh, is from a Latin word that is derived from an older Greek word, Exodus, and it literally means exit or departure. When we look at our exit signs in the building, the history of the word would tell you that our English word goes back to that same word. And so the basic meaning of the name of the book is the exit or the departure. In Luke's gospel, when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, speaking with Moses and Elijah, if you go back and read that passage, the comment, uh, as it appears in the Greek language, uh, we use the word departure, uh, but it talks about the exodus, about Jesus' exodus that was about to occur. And so the word was a very common word as it was used in that day. Uh, to us, it has an archaic sound to it. It's one of those books in the Bible, but we actually have remnants of that word that are in our building wherever we see one of these signs. So it's archaic in the sense of how we view it in light of the literature, but it's still in use today in so many ways. It is a, a departure or a way of departure. And so that's what is going to be described in the book. In terms of chronology, 
We read in 1 Kings 6, 1 that the Exodus took place 480 years before the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel. That verse is referenced for you in the outline that you have. In the 480th year after the Israelites had come out of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, that's loosely a period of April, May in the springtime in the Hebrew calendar, uh, in the month of Ziv, the second month, he began to build the temple of the Lord. So exactly when was that? Well, the little tilde mark that's there says that's kind of sort of. What that means is kind of sort of in common language or approximate, okay? We, we think that we can reasonably place the date of the Exodus around 1446 B.C. And so, you know, we, uh, we have some really smart people that study these things and and I remember I took a course in seminary called Historical Geography of Bible Lands. It was fascinating to listen to. I can't remember a whole lot from it because it was an overwhelming amount of data. What I do remember was we learned a Hebrew folk song called Hine Matov. And I'm not going to sing that song for you, but uh, it's, I remember that. And lo and behold, I, I saw my professor pop up on Facebook a while back. And I wanted to post to him and say, Hene my toe, brother. I remember that, if nothing else. But here's the deal. When we study this, we have to be willing to give a little bit of latitude to the dates. Okay? And I'm going to tell you why in practical terms. How many of you, let me put it this way. How many of you remember being born? Come on, show of hands. Everybody that remembers being born... Raise her hand. No takers. Now, that's odd. Now, I don't remember anything about being born. I, I do know that after I'd been here about a week, that one of my daddy's brothers came through, tried to convince my dad to change my name, to name me after my grandfather Mitchell. My mother uh, had a conniption over that. It didn't happen. But, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know anything about that. I just know they told me about it. And so some of us have early childhood memories from stories we heard. Others of you may have, have seen a video of your birth. You may have come along late enough that there was a video made when you were born. And so I don't want to know about that, okay? I, I mean, I faint at the sight of blood. I faint at, well, not always at the sight of blood, but always at the sight of a needle. I mean, you know, look, I've had some really bad experiences in life Got into a little scrap one time many years ago where I got cut with a knife. And, you know, I'm lucky to be alive. I thank God that I'm alive. And, you know, I worked through that. I didn't bat an eyelash. But if you come toward me with a needle, boom, I'm going to hit the floor. That whole childbirth thing on video just gives me a heebie-jeebie. Okay? Let's just keep that a family secret. But here, here's the deal. You may have seen your video, but you don't remember it from when it happened. You just have kind of a late blooming memory that may be there, you know. You may say, well, golly, you know, is that me? But, but it really was or is or whatever the case may be. But you see what I'm saying? We don't remember that. When I pastored in Louisiana, I went to uh, the Jerusalem Baptist Church in July 1982. Now, I'd already been preaching there for a month. The way the church called a young pastor was they had him come up and supply for a couple of weeks to decide if they could stand listening to him week to week. And then they sat down and talked with him about coming in view of a call. And so I got there. And you've got to remember that in, that in 1982, someone that was 90 years of age was born prior to the year 1900. And so when people came in to start or to apply for their Social Security, many times they would come and say, do we have a record of my baptism? You see, I don't have a birth certificate. I have a record in a family Bible. And if we have a record of my baptism, we're trying to establish my age so that I can get my Social Security. 
And these were people, of course, in their 60s, mid-60s, and sometimes 70s coming. And, and so even in our life, we can look back, and we've not been able to be just precise about age. You know, just got to pin that thing down to the minute. And, and look, if you're wired that way, and if this whole discussion creates anxiety for you, remember that one of my majors in seminary was counseling. You come see me after as we get you some help, you know. Uh, get to help help you move past that obsession on that detail but but we we need to just understand that we can go back in the history of the biblical records as archaeologists have uncovered them and we can place events in a reasonable frame of time that tells us about when it happened because secular leaders and other known things in history are hinted at or sometimes outright mentioned in the scriptures and it places the scriptures at that point in world history or ancient Near Eastern history as we know it. And so we can accept that date for the Exodus with, with no problem. Now there are some themes in theology in Exodus and I'm, I trust that our, our sound team's going to follow along with me here and keep these up for you. Uh, although I think you all have an outline. Uh, guys, one of y'all, did y'all get an outline? You know, y'all, somebody hand them an outline so they can follow along back there. But, but anyway, the themes in theology in Exodus, it lays a foundational theology in which God reveals his name, his attributes, his redemption, his law, and how he is to be worshiped. And it further reveals insights into the nature of God. You know what I mean by the phrase, the nature of. We all grew up in a family, and we understood temperament intuitively before we understood it analytically. Now, here's what I mean by that. We grew up, and we learned what mom's and dad's buttons were before we could talk to you about personality and why people have buttons. That's what I mean. We knew, better not say that. We don't use that word. One time years ago, Carol and I had some guests in our home from a different country, and I used a word that in their culture has an entirely different meaning. And we were at the dinner table, and I just happened to make a comment about something being bloody and one of the children in the family got choked. And we all had a bit of a commotion there and everything. And, and I said, are you okay? And, and she got her breath back. She said, oh, Mr. Mitchell, she said, in our country, only sailors use that word, you know. And, and I did not know. On another occasion, I was on a mission trip to India and I used the phrase carnal Christian. Most of you have heard that. Carnal Christian means an immature Christian, someone who's a novice in the faith. We could call them a worldly Christian. And one of the young preachers there, the Indian Nationals, took issue with me and says, you cannot be carnal and be a Christian. Well, I didn't have enough sense to turn off my inner Pharisee, and I began to argue with him. And I mean, it got heated. And so finally, Someone is listening to me, the guest, and him, the native, who is there, and us arguing over this word, and, and I'm trying to explain what carnal means, and I use the word worldly. And he said, worldly, worldly, you mean worldly Christian? And, and I said, yes, a carnal Christian is a worldly Christian. Cannot be carnal and be Christian. You see, for him, it was a black and white dichotomy. It was either or. You can't be carnal and Christian at the same time. But you can be worldly and be a Christian. He grabbed me, gave me the biggest hug, you know, and everything. And I'm like, oh, what's going on? And this older Indian gentleman standing there had been listening to the whole thing for all this time. Hadn't said a word. He said, Brother Mitchell, said he, he again believes you're saved. And I said, okay. You know, we moved on. Words. The nature of God is to love mankind. His nature is revealed in Exodus in many different stories and ways, just as it is revealed all through the Scriptures. And so we learn more about the nature of God. We also see God as the Lord of history and as the God who loves and remembers His people and as God who is Redeemer and the author of our salvation. And this is why it's important to see God this way, is that we look back on the Exodus as something that occurred as an historical event. 
But what we must realize is that we have a personal exodus, that the Lord intervenes in our history, in your history, in my history. He intervenes in our history as a congregation. He takes us and He moves us. He calls us. He reveals His nature to us. Everything that is revealed in Exodus then is revealed now as we walk with God through His Word. And then there's some specific things that happen in the book of Exodus that we'll take note of today, and these will come up later in more detail. First, God reveals Himself to Moses. Now, I mentioned a little about Moses in the introduction, and I won't uh, go back to that, but I will tell you that this passage that reveals God's purpose as God reveals himself to Moses. He calls Moses to a particular task and he reveals his purpose for that call. He said, Moses, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And we have to acknowledge and must acknowledge for our own good and to honor God properly that when God calls someone, he calls him for a purpose. And when God calls that person, male or female, he calls them into his service and to do his purpose. And he's going to equip them and empower them to do his work. One of our members got back just this week from overseas. She flew in yesterday. And we don't mention names because of the public nature of our internet presence and the possible risk to people as they travel. But one of our members just got back to this country yesterday. The Lord has called that young person and gifted them and has a purpose for them. And so we have to recognize this goes way, way back all the way to the call of Moses as we see God moving in the lives of people. And then the Lord gave Moses some signs for assurance. I mentioned the staff last week. We'll come back to the staff at a later time. But God gives Moses some signs for assurance. And then once Moses has, got, has his head around this matter of the fact that God's called him, he's sending Aaron with him to be his mouthpiece. Now you've got to remember this as you read through the book that the Lord gave Moses this man Aaron, to be his mouthpiece. And we don't have record of Aaron, Aaron ever saying very much after that. It seemed like Moses, once he got started talking, he didn't get quiet ever. But we do have a few instances where Aaron acted there. But the Lord gave Moses these signs for assurance. And then he sends Moses and Aaron uh, on this mission. And Pharaoh won't listen. You know, Moses goes in. And, and you, you got to think, you know, this is really uh, pretty gutsy for Moses to go in. I mean, he's wanted for murder. You know, you know, hopefully nobody brought that up. I guess they didn't bring that up because he did what he said he's going to do. And so we don't, you know, I don't want to read too much into it. But it's like whoever remembered all that had died apparently. And so Moses goes in. Pharaoh won't relent. <coughs> Excuse me. And so God sends the plagues. Blood, and then frogs, and then gnats, and then flies, and then the plague upon the livestock, and then the plague of balls. Now, well, let's finish the list. The plague of hail, and then the locust, and then the darkness, and then the, the death of the firstborn uh, occur. And, and so, you read that list in shorthand form like this, and you wonder, Pharaoh was a hard-headed man. I mean, how much did it take to convince this man that God was speaking, let my people go? I have wondered occasionally, though, listening to a sermon. Uh, you know, that's what God was saying, let my people go. If God cried out, you know, long, long, long sermon, maybe a couple of sermons I remember hearing while I was in seminary and chapel, you know, you could kind of, you could hide behind one of the posts in the seminary chapel and ease out through the door and sneak out or sneak in if you needed to without anybody seeing you. Don't tell anybody I said that. I mean, you know, but the seminarians figure that out pretty quick. But, you know, hear this long, long sermon. And I wondered, was God crying out to the preacher as it did to Pharaoh, let my people go? You know, maybe not. Maybe so. We don't know. The Lord sends Moses and Aaron to deliver the people 
And after all of the different signs and things that happened, Pharaoh relented and let the people go. And so the exodus occurs, the departure from Egypt. That portion of the story starts in chapter 12, verse 31, and carries through chapter uh, 17, verse 31. And so when we read the story, there is a miraculous ring to the story that rings true today. Our exodus may not be through water standing up on each side, but when we get to the other end of that experience, we know the power of God to deliver and to preserve just as he did then. And then there is that section of the Exodus, the story of the Exodus that deals with the Ten Commandments in the Book of the Covenant. We know the commandments. And I recall preaching a series on the commandments at a particular church I served. And, and one of the members there told me, he said, I don't ever recall hearing a ser series of sermons on the Ten Commandments. I said, okay, you know, well, we're going to do all ten. And a particular uh, day came on a Sunday. We were one of the commandments that, you know, came time for that sermon. He wasn't there. And, and I called him in town the next day. I said, hey, you weren't there yesterday. What's going on with that? You skipping that sermon? He said, no. He said, I didn't want to see so many people gathered in the same place, publicly embarrassed at the same time, so I just didn't come. Okay. You know, it was kind of an interesting series. But the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God delivered to his people. And then the Book of the Covenant, which is an expansion of the commandments, as we find it, it is an expansion of the commandments that interprets the moral law in ethical terms, in terms of how we treat people. And I'm remind, reminded that the late Finley Edge, the Southern Baptist theologian and ethicist, said that the acid test of our faith is seen in two things. It's not in our orthodoxy, but our orthopraxy. Not in what we say we believe, but in how we relate to other people. And I heard a different ethicist say it this way, that the way we treat another person teaches someone who we really are. Those who observe learn who we really are when they observe how we treat those around us. And so the book of the covenant expands the the principles of the moral commandments out into the way that we treat others and the way that God is to be worshipped. And so at the end of the day, Exodus reminds us that our God is the God who is Lord over history, circumstances, and mankind, and that he hears the cries of and is willing to redeem his people, you and me. So how can you get the most out of this sermon series there's some things you can do to prepare as, as we uh, move out into the coming weeks. Exodus contains 40 chapters. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. You can use a piece of knitting yarn or whatever, crocheting yarn like that. I use it for Bible markers. You can use a regular bookmark or a paper clip or sometimes a sticky note. You'll see me come in with sticky notes in my Bible. You know, it's, that's because I don't, I mean, you know, I need something I can grab and everything like that. So whatever you do is up to you, but mark the book in your Bible and then begin to read it and study it. And you can do that using the guide that Patrick has crafted for us. If you've got a different type of devotional plan, that's okay. Go ahead with your regular devotional plan, but I want to encourage you to incorporate the reading of the book of Exodus into it. Just bring it into your daily devotional, into your weekly study. Please remember to also do your Bible study lesson as it comes up for Sunday. And if you want to work a plan, this kind of works for me. And you can try it if you like. If you do something else, that's great. Just do it. But something that works for me is to like do the study in Exodus or whatever we're working on Monday through Thursday 
And then Friday and Saturday, give my full attention to the passage that's coming up for Sunday and then come in for Sunday morning uh, in Bible study. That's the way I did it uh, when, when I was in a Bible study class. And so it worked for me. That's a lot better than coming in and picking up the book on Sunday morning off the table and, glen- you know, just going over it real quick so you can look intelligent when the teacher asks a question, you know. I mean, just keeping it real. Let's, let's really give some time to, to study in the lesson, and let's give some time to study in uh, the book of Exodus. Use that reading guide and prepare each day. And then use those questions that we've talked about before when you are preparing. You know, you can ask yourself, what does this tell me about God? What does this tell me about mankind? What does this say to me? And how, you know, after I've read and studied this, what would I tell another person about this if they asked me about it? Four real basic questions. What does this tell me about God? What does this tell me about mankind? What does this say to me? And what would I tell another person if they asked me about it? Now, you can do all of those. You don't have to do any of those, but I encourage you to pick at least one and go with it. Make it a part of your personal study of the book of Exodus. And it'll prepare you for coming in for the Sunday morning messages. We're going to close in just a moment. And I want to say this to you, that like every church that's out there, we're facing this wintertime thing again, okay? The C word. You know, used to the C word meant cancer, and that's got a different meaning. And uh, here's, here's what I figured out about this thing. It's here to stay. That's a no-brainer. I mean, that didn't take a lot of brains to figure out. This thing is here to stay. And so what I find, this is just my observation, is that the people of God are never spared the challenges of living. Okay? Becoming a Christian, walking with Jesus, attending church, all those things that we do, those are good things. And the Lord calls us to walk with Him. Those are great things. But none of those things spare us from dealing with the realities of daily life and circumstances. But let me tell you what does prepare us for dealing with those circumstances. When we enter into that personal relationship of faith with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I know many of you. Well except for a couple of guests that I've only met recently. I know all of you looking around. And I've talked with most of you about your faith. But I want you to know that when we talk about a Bible study opportunity like this, to study for the sermon series, that the Lord will use what grows out of your personal study to equip you And to empower you, to equip me and to empower me, to equip us and empower us to deal with the circumstances of life as he walks with us in it. You see, ultimately, that was his promise to Moses. The Lord was patient with Moses with all of his questions and everything that went on in Exodus 3 and 4. But ultimately, God said to Moses, Moses... I will be with you. And so, we're at the flu season. The corona season. The flu-rona season. Talk, heard about somebody this week, two people actually, that the doctor said, you have flu-rona. I said, oh my, <laughs> that's a new one for me. Well, my immunities are greater than 2,500. I'm not scared to hug anybody. I don't want you hugging on me, but you understand what I mean? I mean, I'm not a hugger. You know, I I hide in the corner and watch when all that stuff breaks out. Uh, I mean, just every once in a while, I might might do a side hug or something like that. But here's the deal. 
We've got to keep on living. We need to be faithful to church. We need to be in God's word. We need to be walking with Jesus every day. And as we are in this word, in the study of Exodus, we'll find that God moved powerfully in the lives of a people who were oppressed. And that's the word that resonates with me when I think about the threat of this illness, oppressed. That word resonates. And just as Brad prayed earlier that the Lord has freed us from the shame and guilt of sin, we must also recognize he has freed us from the fear of oppression because we find it here. And the Exodus reveals that and teaches that as powerfully as any passage we find in the Scriptures. So my encouragement, give yourself to it. Let God speak to you in it. And then walk each day faithfully. He'll bless you. Let's pray together. Brad's going to come and lead us uh, for our closing, our closing course. Remember, if you're going to the music meeting, that it has moved to, the, to this end of the fellowship hall. Uh, there are two sides of the fellowship hall. When you go out the door and around and down the stairs and through the doors, first door on the right on the, on the ground floor down there will be where you're going for the music meeting and music ministry meeting. And so we're just going to trust God to just bless all that we do through this winter and spring and do pray for those that you know that are struggling with illness and grief. Stand, if you will, as we pray together and Brad will come to lead us. Father, we thank you for your word that teaches us who you are and that teaches us how you are. Lord, you love us and you call us to yourself. You give to us a purpose for living that transcends this life and that reaches into eternity. And just as you called Moses, you've called each of us to serve your purposes in this world. I pray that each one who is here today would be drawn closer to you. I pray, Lord, if there are any who do not know you personally, that they would enter into the faith relationship with the Lord Jesus that brings salvation, that they would open their heart to you through faith in Christ. And I pray, Lord, for those who are experiencing sickness, that you would grant them healing and encouragement. We pray, Lord, for those who are grieving, that your comfort would be theirs. And now, Lord, as we sing, let us lift our voices in praise so that it honors you, our Deliverer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 